everyone. Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and today I'm very excited to introduce Kenzie Lalonde, who covers the Montreal Canadiens and does the play-by-play -play at the Women's World Hockey Championships for TSN. Thanks so much, uh, Kenzie, for, for coming on the show. I'm really excited. A fellow Ottawa native. I don't know if, does the Stittsville count? Do you, do you say you're from Ottawa? I don't know. How does this work? Yes, Alex. And according to new Ottawa jurisdiction, apparently Stittsville is considered Ottawa now. Oh, really? Wow. So apparently the Stitz Vegasers, they've made it. Stittsvillians, wow. I should Stitz, say, is what is we're Stitz called. Stitz Vegas or Stittsvillian? <laughs> well, Stitz Vegas is what you'd call the town if you're having a night on the town. And <laughs> then if you're from there, you'd be a Stittsvillian. Oh, there you go. You learn something yeah. new every day. There you go. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Uh, I want to ask you, as I do all the time on the show, a little bit about your career. And, and you've had a very, I don't know if unconventional is the right word, but an interesting career path to where you are today. Maybe tell us how you went from playing, being the captain at Mount Allison uh, for, for their women's hockey team and, and to journalism uh, and how you got started in the industry uh, to where you are today. Like, was there a moment where you thought to yourself, hey, me, Kenzie, I want to be a sports journalist? <laughs> that conversation was had when I was very, very young. I grew up watching Holly Horton in the mornings on Sports Center, not thinking much of it in terms of practicality of an industry I'd want to be in, but I always thought it would be super cool to one day work in sports media in sub capacity. So I did always have that little sound in the back of my mind and I was interested in, in marketing and media and I thought okay logistically when you're in your grade 11 grade 12 year uh, let's maybe do a business degree and maybe work for a sports team in front office uh, so that was kind of my mindset through my grade 11 grade 12 years as I continued to play the game and it was in my final year in high school and I didn't know if I wanted to keep playing hockey or not because I was ready you know in, in women's hockey the there is no pro at that time and the end of the career is really college university that was kind of the end game and i was in no capacity a part of any national women's program so i knew that there was a deadline to my career so i figured okay this is a point in my life where i can pivot and find out more about myself and start a new chapter and turns out that wasn't the case i ended up selecting university and playing hockey in the maritimes in new brunswick at mount allison uh, and i did a business degree so i i Figured at the end of it all, I would either do an MBA or do a master's in sports management. And it was in my final year at university, my athletic director, uh, him and I were communicating one day and he um, knew that there was a part of me that thinks it would be pretty fun to start interviewing athletes. And he suggested I start hosting some YouTube shows for our athletic department. Uh, I kind of just said, you know, contact the communications department, rent out a video camera and have fun. Like we want to grow our social presence online so more uh, students and community members know more about our university. So kind of gave me the green light and said, go have fun. And that I did. <laughs> I would sit down with my fellow student athletes and kind of do a get to know, but also make sure it was fun, uh, yeah. whether it was playing a game or a quick Q&A. And that was kind of my first taste of what it was like to interview someone. And I thought, okay, this is this is pretty awesome if I could if I can actually do a living out of this. So I started volunteering with a community channel during my final year at university. Um, and then when I graduated, I, I knew, okay, how do I get into this industry? This is what I want to do. I didn't do a journalism degree. And so when I moved back to Ottawa, I was looking and, and applying to programs like Seneca, like uh, Algonquin's broadcasting program and considering applying. Uh, and, and, but my simultaneously while doing that still grabbing at everything I could to build my my resume and learn more about the the industry so I started volunteering with Rogers doing camera operating uh, I teamed up with U Sports as well and provided some social media hosting uh, as well so the more I kind of just gravitated towards um, opportunities and I built you know more of a resume and the more I clawed into it I, I knew this is what I wanted to do but I always kind of thought I would do uh, more of a social um feel to things or more of an interview landscape. And it wasn't until I started working full time for a community channel, the Maritimes, did I fall in love with broadcasting and the mm -hmm. live element to it. And that's where I got a taste of play by play and, and the formality of, of a live broadcast. And that's, I fell in love with that aspect of things more so than the digital uh, uh, realm. So, so the mainstream of, of traditional uh, broadcasting with a headset or being rinkside is where I really fell in love with it all. What do you love about that, about the just being live and, and broadcasting? Oh, 
<laughs> you're you feel like you're a part of it and as a former athlete i can tap into like the feeling of being left out isn't there i feel mm. like i'm part of it still in some wow. way and um of course i i'm no cheryl pounder i'm no former olympian by any means but having played the game and, and to still feel like you're part of those moments and to watch these athletes achieve the pinnacle of their career, win those gold medals and have an opportunity to showcase the response, what they're feeling, those emotions to, to everybody is amazing because I think for, I've been on the other side of things uh, being interviewed and it's an incredible opportunity. And, and I just want to keep building those, those moments for, for, the players and for fans and hope that someone can resonate with an athlete's story to some capacity, whether that's during the game in the moment or afterwards in an interview setting. How do you like, what do you take from your career specifically when you're interviewing or maybe even in play by play that you use to connect with players or connect with a broadcast when you're uh, doing uh, broadcasting? For me in particular, it's the intermission interviews. That's where I find I can put my athlete hat on really easily and understand that that player is coming on, you know, it's the end of the period. He just finished a shift. He's probably pissed off that he dumped the puck instead of driving wide and making a shot. So understanding that that's where the athletes head at. And so keeping those interviews simple, quick, nothing too, too crazy because that's where their headspace is at. So having that understanding, I find really helps me when I go into those intermission interviews, just knowing, you know, again, where the athlete's mind is at and, and what it kind of feels like to quickly have to flip that switch and, and uh, speak with, with a reporter. It sounds as though you, you look for specific things on the ice or like a play. And then that's how you go into the interview is you take a couple little things that you saw on the ice and then translate it. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. I think there's little moments, of, you know, of course, if there's a goal score nine times out of 10, you might talk to the goal scorer. So, uh, you know, those moments, but I think also when I look back to my Olympic experience mm -hmm. and you might not get the goal score for that intermission interview. So who are you picking to make things relevant and why are they relevant? And I go back to the United States and um, Danny or Cameron Easy had an outstanding shift and she was on a line with Kelly Panic at the time, the Minnesota line and their girls that grew up together. They played against each other in high school and we weren't going to get Danny Cameron Easy, but I was like, let's get Kelly Panic. She can speak to seeing Danny have this unbelievable game, having grown up with her. So let's like quickly get her for that intermission. So moments like that really help when you have a good understanding of who these athletes are and how you can still find relevant, uh, you know, relevant lines to to speak to them with. But at the end of the day, it's very game oriented because mm -hmm. their headspace is in the game. <laughs> what do you say? What, what can you maybe tell us a bit about the story at the Olympics with Sarah Nurse before your interview? I I, I heard that and I, I really laughed. So please uh, share that story quickly. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, that was a great time. You're at the <laughs> Olympic Games. This is, again, we've touched on it. The pinnacle of women's hockey is the Olympic Games. And you have Sarah Nurse, who is about to break the record uh for for most points and we're going into an intermission i think it was a quarterfinal game we're about to do the interview and she's walks over and she just looks at me and she goes i love your eyeshadow and i'm like <laughs> what <laughs> thank you you're in the middle of an olympic hockey game and thank you for noticing <laughs> so it's so many you know she is one of a kind and someone who will tell you she leads with the the fun um she's light she's fun and that's her best her best mindset and best headspace to be playing her best hockey and it just so happens i got to be a part of one of those experiences uh during the intermission of an olympic hockey game was being complimented by sarah nurse which is incredible <laughs> to say <laughs> And and going off the fun part, you and you and Cheryl Pounder have this amazing relationship, it seems, and a lot of fun between you two. I can still see the the video of you two uh, before games uh, for TSN at the World, Women's World Hockey Championships. But tell us a little bit about that, about that relationship between you and Cheryl and, and maybe how that translates into good chemistry for the broadcast itself. Yeah, I'm so lucky to say that one of my coworkers is one of my best friends and and I get to say Cheryl Pounder is my best friend <laughs> and that's pretty incredible as someone who's accomplished so much in their hockey career uh, but she's someone who leads with kindness and leads with fun and it's great you know she gravitates everyone gravitates towards her and it's 
impossible to not be a fan of Cheryl Pounder. She makes the the booth so fun. And in moments where I might be caught up in my own head or focused on something, she just nudges me and she's like, come on, kid, and starts dancing. <laughs> her, she always keeps it light. And she's someone I can turn to for advice and in life and in work. And I think that that really helps resonate on our on our broadcast. And it sounds like people are having fun listening to us. And that's, again, a relationship that's really only transpired over a couple of years. We first worked together in 2021 in the rivalry series. And that was intimidating for me to to work alongside her for the first ever Canada United States game. But within minutes, it was just we were like two hockey gals catching up. And I think that we, we have that same mindset of um just kind of that athlete's point of view and so we relate to a lot of uh a lot of experiences together and it's it's been so fun and I can't believe we've done two world championships together now and mm -hmm. uh it's you know to many more uh you know to see Czechia hosting in 2025 hopefully we'll we'll be there in Prague and tear it up <laughs> that would be the dream <laughs> And, and with that I want to ask maybe for your preparation for Prague but how do you prepare for your play-by-play -play. like give us a little bit of an insight of um kind of your your process and I know you practice pronouncing names like what else do you kind of do to to get ready yeah I think when you come into the women's hockey especially at the world stage you're introducing a lot of these players and a lot of these country storylines to the average viewer who a probably doesn't know much about hockey women's hockey sorry, and be uh, not too much about international hockey. They they may know the Marie Philippe Poulins and the Sarah Nurses, but they might not know who Elena Mills is. And so I take immense responsibility to try and keep that in a tight little bow and, and share that information um, efficiently and um, uh, with, with viewers during the broadcast, which is kind of hard to do. But, you know, again, it goes back to this is their moment. This is their opportunity to... Uh, represent their country on the world stage and so you want to give them that moment and you want to tell viewers who they are so it's a lot of sitting in this chair that I'm in right now <laughs> you know googling stories on them it's great if they play NCAA hockey because the college programs do such an excellent job of stats and and just storytelling in general and a lot of local news outlets in the United States as well do a good job but uh, I do have to call up some friends if I'm reading a Finnish article to maybe help me through a translation, mm -hmm. but I think it also helps to pick up the phone and maybe speak to the team managers of these countries to get a better, you know, feel for what their camp was like. If you ask them a few questions about the players. Uh, so having those face-to-face -face conversations really help. And I think that's kind of a piece to the women's game. That's uh, so helpful and so strong is everyone's so eager to share stories and share information and help us, get the best product out there. So they're willing to take the time to speak with us over the phone. They're willing to, um, you know, for, I've, when the girls were doing media, uh, the power poses, if you will, those cool shots of them with their jerseys and the mm -hmm. smoke. Um, yeah. I, I was standing there and one by one being like, can we just go over the pronunciation of your name? <laughs> <laughs> so putting yourself in opportunities to to be successful and taking the time, it takes a lot of time. And so that was months of work leading up to that world championship of picking up the phone and Googling and um, making sure I, I really do have a good understanding of, of the girls and, and their team so that viewers can maybe become a fan of, of countries and players that they may not be familiar with on a, on a daily basis. I know I know you've covered the like the past two or three world championships, but have you seen a growth in kind of publicity or just the growth of the game as someone uh, doing the broadcast? Yeah, definitely. I think it helps too when it's being done in Canada. You know, we go back to 2020, the bubble, the 2021 that was in Calgary. And that was the first time ever the Group B division was brought being broadcasted. And that was my first ever experience with TSN. So that was my responsibility to uh, to cover that. So you look at, you know, what it is in that Eastern time zone in Canada, the, you know, the, um, the, the sense of responsibility TSN has being that uh, world broadcaster and their desire to do it justice and provide, you know, not just the group A games, but the group B games with the exact same coverage. Um, so just from in terms of responsibility for the network, they've done an outstanding job over the last couple of years. But I think also through print and I look at the Hockey News now, who has channeled outwards and started creating their own uh, women's division, the work, you know, 
they're doing outstanding and it all kind of snowballs one after the other. And so I think that's a great thing. There's a lot of momentum right now. You look at how the PHF continues to grow. Um, so I think the more these women are, are playing in a league on a regular basis and for fans and their communities to go out and, and see them, all of that snowballs into greater growth and hopefully more investment and, um, you know, proper, proper financial compensation for, for the mm-hmm. athletes and for media as well. Mm-hmm. How, how optimistic are you that in the, maybe the next five years, like we look at the WNBA, it's growing women's soccer in, in North America is growing, but especially in Europe, like, do you think hockey might be hitting a bit of a tipping point soon with regards to women's hockey? Yeah, certainly. I would like to see that right now as the PWHPA in particular continues to work through their final agreements, it appears to uh, announce their league. There's still a lot of work work to be done there. And I mean, you look at the major markets of the WNBA that has taken so much time and there's a whole like chicken or the egg, what comes first, the, the finances or show us the product and then we'll invest. Yeah. You know, you really do need to invest first. And the numbers show over the last five five years that when you do put in that funding, here are the results. So you just encourage more um, more investors to have that kind of mindset. And I think that's what has to happen first. I think the money needs to come first and then the results will certainly be there. So I hope that more uh, more companies, more networks and I think that could be the the biggest ticket is to frame um, frame the strategic plan in that way. I, I want to ask you a little bit about kind of being a woman in a male dominated industry with sports media and just what your experience has been like and maybe what advice would you give to young women coming up in the industry? Yeah, it's been a wild ride. Uh, <laughs> I think back to my community television days, uh, where I really was their first ever female, they were still doing um, pro community programming. And so they I hosted a weekly show, a community weekly show, uh, and also a lot of QMJHL hockey and junior A hockey and high school hockey, football, volleyball, all of it. We were doing all of it, but I was still one of their first ever women to do that. So I think of the grassroots level and that, you know, there is still a, a lot of coaches that weren't familiar, you know, they didn't know who I was or didn't really give me the time of day, but would give my, my male co- coworker the time of day. So even on the grassroots level, there's still that, oh, okay, sh- sure. Like still trying to, understand that uh we're doing the job just as much as our our counterparts are so it was interesting I thought at the grassroots level of all places that's where I wouldn't maybe face some difficulties but it prepares you for everything and it's also come with a lot of wonderful opportunities I think the more I continue to uh call do play by play especially around the women's game I think it's been so incredible to have a female voice behind a women's product I think any chance you can do that that's great but at the end of the day I know if I'm earning an opportunity it's because I'm good at it and so um I think that's first and foremost something I love to to share that with young broadcasters especially women interested in 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 play by play is understand you belong there and that you have to have the courage to learn and put yourself out there and call a game that might suck, but you learn something from it and people are going to have opinions on you. And if that's the first game and only game they ever hear, then so be it. But you have to have that kind of um, that confidence and uh, be okay with, with learning as you do. And that's kind of the, the nature of the game when it comes to this industry is you learn by doing, and that's so hard to do, especially now when I'm on a larger scale with, with a larger network, it makes it a little more difficult, but I just, again, I, I like to tell, especially the Montreal market, be patient with me. I, you know, I think I'm coming in at a great time when the team's new, there's a big, um, you know, rotation right now with, um, a young team, but an exciting team. And I relate to that as well. I'm, I'm one of the younger reporters here in this, in this uh, market. And so I think I'm, I'm coming in at a right time when there's a lot of uh, breath of fresh air in this region. And I think a lot of uh, viewers are enjoying that. And so I, I do like that. I have that advantage. What's it been like for you to, to cover the Habs? And I know, I think you said somewhere that as a, as a kid, you dreamt of being on sports center. So what was that like to, to be on sports center? <laughs> Yeah, that was crazy. My first time, I think, doing a segment with Jay Onret, he made a a segment out of it, like La Ronde de la Ronde. I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> but 
we're about to do the hit and he's like Kenzie what kind of music do you like and I said oh well I really love like the great big C and Alan Doyle like those maritime connections and he's like yeah that's not gonna work all right (laughs) I'm like, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, you'll see it tomorrow morning. I'm like, (laughs) okay. So I woke up the next day and saw his little segment, which was hilarious. And so that next morning, seeing it, watching that back of of the conversation with Jay, someone who I grew up with Jay and Dan days, uh, Mm -hmm. was pretty pretty remarkable. And and my father grew up a Montreal Canadiens fan. He grew up in Shakutami and then St. Bruno. So I think for him in particular, this is unbelievable that his daughter is <laughs> uh, a part of this market and gets to share um share the insights with uh with the region so i know for for our family the lalone family in particular it's pretty surreal that's awesome that's great to hear i i, I always ask before we get into the habs who you cover i always ask a question to to the reporters about if they were the nhl commissioner or even like the head of the ihf and you're on the rules committee what rule would you change kenzie Okay, well, I like that you said the IIHF because this most recently, we just kind of went through this. For the IIHF, when you're looking at the uh, directorate awards, the all-star awards, all of those need to be submitted by, I believe it's the first period of the gold medal game. And in the women's, which is tip, which is normal. That's typically oh, even it? in the, yeah, even in the NHL, I believe the uh submission has to be in by the first period or the second period as well so that's typical but in particular when you're dealing with the women's game and where women's hockey is at right now I believe that that should be submitted as late as you can get in that third period because nine times like that gold medal game is featuring the best of the best it's featuring Poulin and Hillary Knight and some of the best players in the world so you in my you know, it's kind of like CFL football. Some of the greatest moments happen in the final five minutes and that's where your stars come to play. And so I believe that that needs to be reflected in the awards that are given out. So I really want to see them push that deadline to maybe the third period, or if you can, at the end of the game, it's simply, you know, it's simply an award and give it out. I, I don't know if there's a way to streamline that to better reflect who the stars are at the end of the game for the women's game in particular, for where they're at. I think that needs to be changed. Um, so that's my that's what I'll say on on that. Okay, great. No, I mean it's not like the U.S. and Canada play close games in the finals. It's that it's that never yeah, it's, happens. It's not so, like it's a score of three to two or anything. It's not like I don't know. When they has like fifteen overtime gold medal winners that probably <laughs> cements her as the tournament MVP. Uh, but yeah, no, exactly. I, I want to go to the Habs, of course, and and your first year covering them this year. How would you assess maybe their year? their their year last year but and then maybe what do you think their goal is preliminarily going into next season it's funny I think Barty St. Louis said this at the end of the year just that was a year of hockey he has never experienced because of the injuries he has never been a part of something player or coach or anything he's never seen anything like that before I mean towards the end that was practically the Laval Rockets out yeah. there it, it was in, insane and so with that seeing them give a run to Boston they had a stretch there they won four of the five games they saw Boston they saw the Leafs uh they saw Carolina and they held their own for the majority of those games and if you look at you know you, you have Raphael Harvey Pinard got a hat trick in one of those games and you're seeing guys I mean Jack Guy Gooley were injured towards the end of it you see Jordan Harris just play, being a top four defender and holding their own against a team like the Bruins was remarkable. So you see that grit, you see that drive. Um, so there are a lot of good things to take away from that season in, in hopes that uh, these guys can get healthy. I mean, we ran into Cooley, uh yesterday at a Formula mm-hmm. One event and, he, and he's doing great, which is awesome. When we heard Cole's back skating, he's back to full clearance of, of physical activity. So that's awesome. So hopefully this, you know, as we go, as I go through some, I make out some of these mock uh, lineups. I'm like, Oh my God, that's right. Slavkovsky. He's been out for quite some time. So you, you know, I I'm excited to see a healthy Montreal Canadiens team as we lean into this upcoming year and, and knowing Cole's locked down for eight years is remarkable. I think of the tandem ship and the, 
you know, this dynamic duo of Suzuki and Caulfield that will go down in history as me as like a Kane and Taves duo. When you look at like franchise um, elements uh, in recent decades, I, I think they can be that for the Montreal Canadiens. So that's super exciting. Um, I'll be interested to see who they pick in the upcoming draft. They are the only mm-hmm. Canadian team in the uh, within that, that uh, first round, I believe. So mm-hmm. we'll see if they... Go, you know, there's a there's conversation of will it be Will Smith uh, with that familiarity of Kent Hughes um, or Mitch Koff? I, I think what I will say about that, and Craig Button made a very good point about this, is yes, okay, he has signed for another three years to his team in Russia. So that means he's coming out at 21 years old, sign him to an entry level contract. Well, that and he is well developed. That's and probably an incredible athlete at a reduced rate for the Canadian. So in a way that could be a very good deal. So when he brought forward that, my, um, that's, you know, way of thinking the other day, I was, you know, you think about that and um, it, you know, if, if the argument there is it's strictly based on his um, contracts with, with his, his Russian team, that's certainly a positive outlook. You could look at that if, if the Canadians do select him, but again, it's a tight lip network so we'll never know leading yeah. into into that draft in nashville who they'll select but i think it's an exciting time here leading up to the draft for canadians fans what else do you think they might do this off season? there's a lot of rumors i'm an adjacent jets fan so everyone's talked about pierre luc dubois to montreal for probably like a year and a half so wh- what do you think they might do not just on dubois but in general what might be their goals this off season? yeah i think you know you you bring him up and i think now the conversation is well how much are they going to Ben, to, to get how much are they willing to upfront for him? You know, the the rumor out there is he'd be asking for upwards of eight, almost nine million. I do not, in my heart, believe the Canadians will want to pay that. Uh, but but you never know. I think you look at, um, I mean, Duran, Monaghan, those guys with contracts come off the books. It, it was such a hard year for Sean Monaghan to see him get re-injured like that mm-hmm. because he is someone who we know, A, is loving his time here in Montreal, and B, is a guy that can easily be integrated in this lineup or for any other team. So his marketability factor is, is so good. And so I think the Canadians have a um, have a great edge with Monaghan if they choose to keep him or, or have him go elsewhere. And I think the ultimate decision short term is what will they do with Dennis Garianoff? I don't think they'd be interested in in fronting up that 2.9 million, try and bring him in at a um a reduced contract for for the upcoming year. I do really want to see Alex Bilzil get a one-way contract in the NHL. That guy deserves it. Um and I think big picture as well. You really got to give a nod to the to the Rockets and the development program for the Canadians. I think this is probably the first time in many, many years where, you, you know, the NHL, the market, the fans got a feel for what's happening in the AHL and how well can they translate to the NHL. Last year is a really good example of what's possible in that in that league. And Alex Bilzil and Raphael harvey Pernard are two guys that really ran away with their opportunity and showed that they're ready. Why do you think uh, Harper Jack guy is such a fan favorite? Like, what do you think about him? Wi-Fi? Why, what, 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 what do you think he brings to the table that Habs fans love? It's funny you said that, Alex. He, I don't know if he lives near me, but him and his buddies were biking, <laughs> renting those Bixie bikes, and they were on like a nice little jaunt up the road the other day. And I was like, Is that? that's Arbor Jack guy on a bike ride with his buddies. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's that blue nose, uh, you know, blue nose, the blue collar um, work ethic that he brings to the table. He is not, you know, he's that old school hockey player. And in a, in a world now where guys like that seem to be harder to come by, he brings it all to the table. He wears his heart on his sleeve. Um, and he's got a good personality to him. I think he's someone that uh, isn't afraid to be himself, which can be hard uh, with, with media and, and um, in, in today's day and age and being a professional athlete, but he is so truly himself. And again, is someone undrafted and held his own on the back end in the NHL in his first year. It's, it's remarkable. And I think a lot of players look up to him and who doesn't want to nickname Wi-Fi. I think that's great. <laughs> no. Yeah, I know for sure. I mean, I was at a Sens Habs uh, game this year and I think I probably saw at least like 30 Jack Eye jerseys, which is pretty remarkable. Um, honestly. Yeah. So my question now, when they re-signed Pezzetta, I was yeah. like, is the merchandise department going to start selling Pezzetta wigs? Like, are they going <laughs> to, is that going to be for sale? Like his yeah. flow? Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. Will, that, uh, will that be a, a, 
an item you that's can his purchase. bonus his bonus is the money they make off those that that's his bonus there you go yes. yeah exactly um i want to go to slavkovsky you mentioned him uh briefly maybe what do you think the expectation will be he had a kind of up and down rookie year got injured how what do you think the expectations are for him next uh year well i know it- probably two different types of expectations the expectations for himself you know is he wants to get quicker and he wants to shoot more he kind of said that towards the end of his season I think the expectations for Marty St. Louis are to continue learning and he has provided a space for these young players to fail and that's okay and you know you'll be given second chances so I know for Marty St. Louis if you build off of what he was saying last year to keep going, learning, trying, and failing, and, and mm-hmm. however that may be. Now, if you're you're Kent Hughes, do you want to see that in the Laval Rocket system, or do you want to see that growth within the Canadians' room? I, I'm not sure, but I think considering he he unfortunately couldn't finish that last half of his season, makes me wonder what what will happen here as he starts off in this first month. I think there's a lot of of growth opportunities. Just you look at his size and when he has the opportunities to shoot the puck, he's got an excellent release. So making sure he gets in those spaces. And uh, again, I think just Marty St. Louis has touched on this as well. His awareness uh, of of how to use that reach, how to use that length to his advantage um, will be skills he'll look to develop. But I think will come with time and and whether that space happens the NHL level or AHL level we'll see but uh, I think he'll be he'll be fun to watch here when you give him another couple of years I'm excited to see the kind of player he can be and and for next year what do you think the expectations will be for this team I think uh Kent Hughes talked about they'll talk about playoffs or something along those lines like what are the expectations for the Habs next year I think they will certainly want to win more stay healthy uh and I think we'll see what kind of changes they bring in the off season. If maybe they add a veteran defender and how that will change the dynamic. I think also trying to find a stable left winger for Suzuki and Caulfield could maybe help bring uh, more an offensive punch um, to their, to the, um, to the forward side of things. So I think that, you know, incrementally the desire to win more will be there. And as we know, and, and Marty and, and Kent Hughes constantly share this, it's, it's a balancing act of winning versus developing. So monitoring that over the next couple of years will be very interesting. You know, in, in what moments will they pull back from development and push to win? And at what moments um, will decisions be made to, to, you know, put the development of, of these players and, and um, maybe future acquisitions uh, at the forefront. Well, before I let you go, uh, Kenzie, I really appreciate you you taking the time, but I know you love Brian McGratton and war number 16. Um, and so obviously the Sens just got sold. You were a fan growing up. How optimistic are you for the future of the team under new ownership? And, and, and just what do you make of uh, maybe Michael and Lauer and, and that whole new ownership uh, coming to Ottawa? Yeah, so I mean, well, I guess I'll have to sell his, uh, sell the sh- his share of the Montreal Canadiens. So changing of the tide there, um, but I think it's super exciting. Uh, there is a something um, new and buildable that's happening in in Ottawa right now. When you look at some of their uh, their pillars and Kachuk and Stutzla, um, uh, I- I'm really excited. I think this new age of of that grittiness that they're bringing to the table reminds me of when I was a fan and the run they had in 07. I mean, will they have that kind of run and play the ducks in the Stanley cup final? I don't know, but I had the atmosphere that was around the community at that time reminds me of what's happening now. And mm-hmm. so to have brand new ownership, maybe that a new rank down at um, Le Breton flats can really bring in new fans and, and new energy. Um, but I'm super excited and as someone who grew up in the West End, I'll always love to have that stadium in Canada, about 10 minutes from Stittsville. So I'll always be biased. <laughs> I do yeah. enjoy having this st- stadium in the West End. But I think uh, where the Canadian, or uh, sorry, where the Ottawa Senators are at right now is maybe where the Canadians will be in, in a year or two. So that's exciting. I think you're one of the only people that is not excited for the team to to move the arena downtown. So I I, <laughs> I know. It's not a popular opinion, but it's the truth, Alex. It, it might it might be the popular opinion in, in Stitz Vegas or Stitz Billion. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Kenzie, for doing this. I just want to give you the floor. Is there anything at TSN that you're working on that people should kind of 
uh, know or anything you want to plug? I think right now, um, CFL season is upon us, people. So the Red Blacks are playing tonight. If you are in Ottawa, turn on that. Uh, I think it's on at 7.30 tonight. I asked Claire Hannah to eat uh, this new donut that. dish on air. Will she do it? Let's find out. I, I don't I think so. I've, I've had her on. I, I don't think she has the nerve. No. Ah, her and Dwayne, I'd love to see them crush some food one day on air. So, yeah, CFL season's uh, upon us. So what a better way to spend your summers than to get out to a game or – Sit back on the patio and uh, and tune in. We'll see. Well, thank you so much, Kenzie. I really appreciate you taking the time and coming on. I had a lot of fun, and I hope you did too. Any time for a for a fellow Ottawa, 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 Ottawa. What are we? Yeah. Ottawa. I, okay. I, an odd. Yeah, Dinsvillian and an Ottawa. Yeah, yeah. That that sounds okay. That sounds passable for now. Yeah, exactly. We'll stick with that. We'll yeah. work on it. We'll, we'll work on it next time. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Kenzie, and, and have a great day. Thank you.